Hello, and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And thank you very much for today joining us for a long-form analytical discussion of the seminal comedy classic, The Interview, starring Seth Rogen and James Franco. Nah, I'm just kidding. But The Interview presents a great jumping-off point for the story that we're about to talk about today. And that's with respect to how Sony is dealing with The Last of Us Part Two leaks. Now, if you aren't familiar with this story, significant parts of The Last of Us Part Two got leaked earlier this week. Significant meaning cutscenes, whole characters, whole plot points within the game that weren't intended to be shown to the public until they had their hands on the game. And I've highlighted right now a Game Daily Biz article that I gave quotes to in which I was asked, what could Sony's litigation strategies be? In particular, with respect to the rumor that a disgruntled Naughty Dog employee had disseminated the materials. And in that particular instance, Sony has a great claim because employees have signed contracts with the company. There's an actual relationship there. And you can actually go and say, this is a breach of these words that you agreed to that you signed up to. And we can sue you for that breach. Now, as it turns out, that may or may not be the case, as we will see. And that's going to be what we wind up talking about in today's video, because Sony has dealt with this kind of thing before. But before we get there, after this all happened, different YouTubers started talking about the leaks. Now, some of those YouTubers are undoubtedly violating fair use. They're probably playing whole clips. They might be doing other things that are potentially problematic. But many of them appear to have not been doing that. And by just discussing the leaks, that wouldn't necessarily infringe on any kind of copyright. Nevertheless, Sony has been issuing DMCA takedown notices to these various YouTubers that are either analyzing or critiquing the screenshots or video clips that have been released. Maybe they are only discussing what's happening in that space. And to the extent that no copyrighted materials are actually used, it is clear that a DMCA takedown notice is unwarranted. In those situations, this thumbnail that I'm highlighting right now is from a video I did two days ago, which has been very well received. And I appreciate everybody that's checked it out. Please share it around with anybody that you think might be interested. But that talks about the fact that the DMCA only really addresses the use of copyrighted materials. And if there is no use and copyright can't cover facts, it can't cover ideas, it can only cover the expression of those things in a medium, the actual game, the clips, the script, whatever it might be, then if there is no use, then it is undoubtedly abusive. And so Sony is apparently going around and using the DMCA as a cudgel, as a sledgehammer, to force YouTubers to think twice about even talking about this in a way that, in my opinion, is very abusive, very problematic, And that's why I did this video. But as it turns out, Sony has a history of this, and it's one that I think is well worth talking about in the context of what is happening right now today. So yesterday, in Games Industry Biz, Sony actually gave a comment about this whole leak situation. And they wound up saying the following. Sony has confirmed to Games Industry Biz that it has identified the primary individuals responsible for the leaks earlier this week, saying that they were not affiliated with Sony Interactive Entertainment or Naughty Dog, as was rumored. The publisher declined to comment further, saying that the information was currently subject to an ongoing investigation. Now, there's a couple things I want to say about this statement. One, it's not a statement, right? This is a paraphrase. Sony has confirmed and didn't give a quote. So this is Games Industry Biz talking to us and not Sony. Secondly, you'll note the use of the word primary here. It says it has identified the primary individuals, you'll note the plural there, responsible for the leaks and saying that they are not affiliated with Sony Interactive Entertainment or Naughty Dog. A couple things are happening there. Primary suggests that they don't necessarily know that they have everybody involved with the leaks. Individuals suggest that there's a number of people that might be involved. And then saying that they are not affiliated with Sony Interactive Entertainment or Naughty Dog, just as a lawyer, I might point out, could actually describe someone that had previously been fired from Sony Interactive Entertainment or Naughty Dog. Affiliated usually can be read to mean that you've never been affiliated, but that's not necessarily what has been communicated here. So if you want to put on your conspiracy theory hat and you want to say, ah, corporations, they like to massage their messaging, you could say, hmm, they think it might be a group. It might be someone that was fired by Naughty Dog and was upset about it maybe in the same kind of context that was already rumored. I don't know that this message actually gets you out of that block, but 
let's take it on faith that Sony isn't just bald face lying. If they aren't just bald face lying, then what we are now dealing with is Sony claiming that they were hacked. And maybe it's a digital hack. Maybe somebody left a hard drive somewhere. That doesn't really matter. They are saying that somebody that is not affiliated with them, that they don't have a contract with, an illegal actor came in and stole their information. Fortunately for us, we have seen how Sony deals with these kinds of situations in the very recent past. I've pulled up an article from Wired. You can find a dozen of these in every periodical across the internet from this time frame from December of 2014 that says Sony got hacked hard. What we know and don't know so far. Now, if you can't remember all the way back to 2014, long time ago, especially in internet years and especially in 2020, that might be two decades ago based on how long the weeks run right now, this was a hack of Sony's email servers and got all of this information out. It was put on WikiLeaks. All this kind of stuff got out. A lot of stuff that was very problematic for Sony. And the FBI wound up saying that it was probably related to North Korea being upset about the release of this movie, The Interview, that was very negative towards North Korea. Now, there's still some doubts among various parties about whether or not that actual assertion is correct, but that doesn't matter for our purposes. What matters is how Sony reacted. So as soon as this information started getting out there, everybody and their brothers started reporting on it. This was newsworthy stuff. This was interesting stuff. This was the managers of various organizations within Sony talking about how they felt about President Obama, exactly how they were going to market things, what money was going to change hands between them and the MPAA. There was all sorts of interesting stuff in there, and there was some stuff that was perhaps just scandalous or gossipy. But either way, reporting was done. Everybody and their brothers started reporting on these emails. And as a result of that, Sony got mad. Now, you see here in the reline that I put in the thumbnail, this is an, a letter, an actual paper letter sent by their law firm that was sent to every media outlet. I pulled up the Hollywood Reporter version of this that claims that they can't report on this information. Let's take a look at what they actually wound up saying here. As you are no doubt aware, Sony Pictures Entertainment has been the victim of a theft of data stored on its computers. Now, I do want to take a step back here. We're talking about Sony's Pictures Entertainment. That isn't the same as Sony Interactive Entertainment, who appear to be the ones that are using the DMCA to strike down these various YouTube videos online. But they are sister subsidiaries amidst the same global organization, as you can probably tell from the use of the name Sony. So in general, because this is a legal issue and that has to be run through so many different hoops, I think we can assume that the basic tacts that Sony Pictures Entertainment tries to use here are ones that Sony Interactive Entertainment would like to use, would, would try to use potentially, and they're going about it a different way with respect to YouTube. But it wouldn't surprise me if these letters were either sent to game journalism outlets or are to be sent if somebody tries to report on them in the future. As you may be aware, in an ongoing campaign explicitly seeking to prevent SPE from distributing a motion picture, the perpetrators of the theft have threatened SPE and its staff and are using the dissemination of both private and company information for the stated purpose of materially harming SPE unless SPE submits and withdraws the motion picture from distribution. We have reason to believe that you may possess or may directly or indirectly be given illegally obtained documents or other information stolen from SPE, defined term, the stolen information, pursuant to the perpetrator's scheme. The stolen information includes, but is not limited to, Documents and information protected under U.S. and foreign legal doctrines protecting attorney-client privileged communications, attorney work product, and related privileges and protections, as well as private financial and other confidential information and communications of SPE's current and former personnel and others, confidential personal data, intellectual property, trade secrets, and other business secrets and related communications and other confidential information. Lawyers like to repeat things. If you count up that sentence, how many times they say the word confidential information? Repetition is the branding iron of knowledge, but it doesn't lead to great drafting of English sentences. We are writing to ensure that you are aware that SPE does not consent to your possession, review, copying, dissemination, publication, uploading, downloading, or making any use of the stolen information 
and to request your cooperation in destroying the stolen information. They don't consent to you having that document at all. Unfortunately, that's not really a legal doctrine. And you'll note here in this kind of demand letter or a cease and desist letter, as you might otherwise hear it called, that there's a real lack of reference to statute or contract terminology or anything like that. If you receive one of these, or if you're writing one of these, if you're a law student or maybe you're a young lawyer, one of the things that you generally want to do is establish the authority under which you are asking the other party to do something, to say you are in violation of this statute, you are in violation of this law, this rule, this regulation, and not just a blanket claim that, hey, there's a lot of stuff that's important and you have it and we would not, we don't like that. That's, that's not a great legal letter and you can see it right on the front page. As soon as you suspect that you may have possession of any of this stolen information, we ask that you promptly tell us, prevent anybody at your institution from using it, arrange for and supervise its destruction, and then certify to us that it has been destroyed. In addition, if you've provided stolen information to anyone outside of your company, send them this letter. And otherwise, contact us on, uh, on this letter contact information. If you do not comply with this request and the stolen information is used or disseminated by you in any manner, SPE will have no choice but to hold you responsible for any damage or loss arising from such use or dissemination by you, including any damages or loss to SPE or others, and including but not limited to any loss of value of intellectual property and trade secrets resulting from your actions." In other words, this is the threat paragraph of this letter. If you, press member, report on a newsworthy item in your possession through no illegal activity of your own, we will, quote unquote, hold you responsible for the damages done to our intellectual property by you legally reporting on that material. This is a complete, ridiculous legal claim. And as we'll see, most of the journalists responded to it as such, right? When you have that information in your hands, especially when it's newsworthy, and we're going to talk about that concept as well, you don't have an obligation to keep it confidential. You can report on it. Now, actually sharing that confidential information might start to run up against things like copyright. Most of these places wound up linking outside of their sites to that information and reporting on the contents, the details. But note how that is analogous to what we're talking about with respect to The Last of Us. We are talking about YouTubers who are discussing the nature of the leaks, what it might mean for the future of Naughty Dog, what they're doing with this project, whether or not this story makes sense as a follow-up to part one. And they are commenting on those things and maybe they're sharing some of it. Maybe they're analyzing it and we'd have to get into fair use discussions there. But if they're not, they're just discussing these things. They're reporting on them. And while we don't generally think of YouTubers or influencers as the press or journalistic outlets, in 2020, people with YouTube channels with sufficient audiences that report on news, that discuss things, that hit the news, are a form of journalistic outlet today. And it's worth noting that in no way has the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution or any other freedoms really associated with the Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution been associated only specifically with having some kind of licensure or certification. Freedom of the press is not something that only attaches to what we might put in a bucket called the press. It's the freedom to have the distribution of news items, to have this critique and analysis, the freedom of speech. And the press isn't a separate body that gets more rights than an individual that just happens to run a successful YouTube channel. So that's not something that is different here, even though these letters are sent to The Hollywood Reporter and Variety and elsewhere. If these letters were sent to your favorite YouTuber or your least favorite YouTuber, that doesn't change the rights that they might otherwise have under the U.S. Constitution to disseminate newsworthy items. If you have previously had access to or received stolen information and have exercised restraint with regard to its publication, use, or dissemination, SPE and its employees are sincerely grateful to you and ask for your continued exercise of restraint. We're in a very weird land of demand letters here, right? Hey, if you didn't do this, which we said was illegal, we're grateful to you. You're not usually grateful for somebody not violating the law. So if you're grateful to them, you're really talking about an ethical kind of concept, right? And I do think ethics plays into this. 
I do think if you want to criticize YouTubers or anyone else online for disseminating this information and hurting what people are excited about and saying they shouldn't disseminate that, that is well within your rights. That is different from they should be legally penalized for disseminating it. Ethics and law often overlap, but not entirely. And you can have an ethical claim against somebody and that doesn't rise to the level of a legal claim. And this is the basics of the of the letter. This was what was sent out. And as you might suspect, as we are seeing happen with respect to these YouTubers, a Streisand effect occurred almost immediately. You don't tell the New York Times not to disseminate newsworthy information. The New York Times comes out, says, Sony Pictures demands that news agencies delete stolen data. That's right. When you send a letter like that, you create a newsworthy news story. And so... With that, as they're jumping off point, they're able to report on the delivery of the letters. And you know what they do as part of that report? Well, they wind up reporting on some of the stuff in those leaked informational materials. One of the most volatile email exchanges, which included racially insensitive banter about President Obama's imagined preference for black-themed movies, prompted public apologies by Amy Pascal. Oh, yes. If you do this, if you take this move, if you do this and you send it to Hollywood Reporter, you send it to Variety, you send it to the New York Times, to Wired, whoever else, you get reporting on it, right? You get a virtual legality video talking about how it appears that you're abusing the law. And regardless of whether or not I talk about the specifics of the leaks, which I won't do here because I don't know them, I will talk about your actions with respect to the DMCA. I will talk about these ridiculous letters you sent in respect of your earlier leaks earlier in the the last decade, and I can do that. That's newsworthy. Now, these people that are at YouTube and are otherwise talking about the leaks and discussing them and analyzing them, that's also very likely newsworthy, but they would at least have to have the discussion with respect to some of the stuff in American jurisprudence. And to talk about that a little bit more, I wanted to bring up an important case that was about now 20 years old, but it talks about whether or not someone that gets information is responsible for the illegal activity that gave rise to that information and that the Supreme Court held was not the case. In this particular case, Bartnicki versus Vopper, an unidentified person intercepted and recorded a phone call between the chief union negotiator and the union president during collective bargaining negotiations involving a teacher's union and the local school board. After a teacher favorable proposal was accepted, a radio commentator played a tape of the intercepted conversation. Petitioners filed suit under both federal and state wiretapping laws. No, wiretapping laws say that you are forbidden from doing certain surreptitious recording of other people's activities, but it is a specific statute. And if you violate it, you are violating the law. That's important because there has to be some illegal activity claimed before you even get to this point. That's why it is important that Sony is talking specifically about hacking. Yes, a breach of contract is a certain kind of illegal activity, but it's not as kind of uh, critical as an actual third-party hostile force coming in and stealing your information. The court is going to be more likely to look at you sympathetically if that's the story that you can tell if you're Sony. They alleged that an unknown person using an electronic device had surreptitiously intercepted their telephone conversation and sought to have the publication of that information punished. Now, it wasn't punished. And that's an important part of this discussion. The Supreme Court says, no, that's not what really happens here. The issue here is a narrower version of the question. Where the publisher has lawfully obtained information from a source who obtained it unlawfully, may the government punish the ensuing publication based on the defect in the chain, the chain of title, right? So in this particular instance, what we've got with respect to Last of Us, and if we assume Sony's telling the truth, all of this makes sense. Sony gets hacked. The hacked materials are then disseminated. The people that get a hand on that disseminated information acted lawfully. They didn't encourage these people to sue, uh, to, to steal this information. They didn't encourage its theft. They just wound up getting the information through no fault of their own. They obtained it lawfully without violating any laws. There was somebody that violated the laws as part of the chain of title, but does that mean that the last party that holds it must be prohibited from disseminating it? And here the court holds that they don't, that the dissemination is okay, but That's not the end of the story. And it never is in virtual legality, right? We talk about these things all the time. There's always nuance. 
the government's interest in minimizing the harm to persons whose conversations have been illegally intercepted is stronger. Privacy of communication is an important interest. However, in this suit, privacy concerns give way when balanced against the interest in publishing matters of public importance. Now, one thing that's important here is to note that public importance, public concern, isn't really something that is defined. I know folks come into virtual legality, they leave comments to these videos, and they get upset when we talk about court cases, when we talk about the state of the law, and how much is based on the facts and circumstances of the case before any given court. And that the court sets up these various doctrines and they get to decide them on the fly in respect of any given case. And this is going to be one of those types of situations because the overall rule is that that third party that didn't do anything illegally can absolutely disseminate that information. Accordingly, in New York Times Co. versus the United States from 1971, the court upheld the right of the press to publish information of great public concern obtained from documents stolen by a third party. Again, that requirement of public concern is one of those areas where Sony or any other giant corporation that has lost their information could come around on you. In considering the balance, we acknowledge that some intrusions on privacy are more offensive than others, and that the disclosure of the contents of a private conversation can be an even greater intrusion on privacy than the interception itself. But no, we aren't making a decision in this case about what we're really concerned about when we're talking about The Last of Us and Sony. We need not decide whether that interest is strong enough to justify the application of this statute, a criminal statute, to disclosures of trade secrets, which is really what we're talking about in Last of Us, or domestic gossip or other information of purely private concern. This case from 1967 reserved the question of whether truthful publication of private matters unrelated to public affairs, can be constitutionally prescribed. In this particular case, however, we don't need to address that question because when we are talking about union negotiations, it's clearly a public matter. Now, that's not the end of the story either. Moreover, our decisions establish that absent exceptional circumstances, reputational interests alone cannot justify the prescription of truthful speech. Sony can't just send a letter that says, this hurts us, this makes us look bad, this lowers the value of our intellectual property. Reputational interests alone cannot justify the prescription of truthful speech. But public concern still comes into play. We think that it's clear that a parallel reasoning requires the conclusion that a stranger's illegal conduct does not suffice to remove the First Amendment shield from speech about a matter of public concern. The months of negotiations over the proper level of compensation for teachers at the Wyoming Valley West High School were unquestionably a matter of public concern, and respondents were clearly engaged in debate about that concern. That debate may be more mundane than the communist rhetoric that inspired Justice Brandeis's classic opinion in Whitney versus California, but it is no less worthy of constitutional protection. Now, that's important as well, because what's clearly public concern is things that deal with the government, things that deal with negotiations of public institutions like schools, education, anything else that might otherwise touch on your state, local, or federal government. But in this particular instance, it's very clear that the court wants to establish that just because it doesn't rise to the level of democracy versus communism, that doesn't make it non-public, that doesn't make it not interesting. And so one of the questions that really hasn't been litigated, because for the most part, almost everything gets settled and the companies really don't want to have it litigated, is when you're talking about a large multinational corporation, when you're talking about something like the Sony emails, when you're talking about how they interact with what they are putting out there in the popular culture that can change various ways in which we view the world, is that a matter of public concern? And these journalistic outlets almost undoubtedly would hold that it is. Right? Sony Pictures demands that news agencies delete stolen data. The New York Times reported on it, but they also reported on the substance of these emails. One, because they know that they're probably going to win the day if they actually get sued. Two, because they're the New York Times and they have lawyers on retainer and they have the money to actually defend against this kind of thing and can potentially have their own Streisand effect to actually help them if Sony wound up suing them. But it's not an open and shut question. And in the age of the digital internet, it becomes even more problematic for all of these people that are operating in a kind of press capacity, as we might assume that looked at the founding of the country, but that otherwise are just people. 
right? One person on Twitter wound up going through the archive of emails and Sony threatened to sue Twitter unless it removed tweets containing the hacked emails. Now, this letter that threatens to sue Twitter is even crazier than the letter we just read with respect to The Hollywood Reporter because not only did The Hollywood Reporter have the First Amendment rights and get those protections and it was ridiculous to even assert that they didn't, but they at least published what they published, right? Variety at least published what they published. Twitter is not responsible for what is published on its service. It is a platform provider. And I know that gets people upset. I know people want to talk about what is a platform and what is a publisher. I have a great video on that. Look up CDA 230 in my series here on virtual legality. But suffice it to say, the baseline rule is that Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Steam, whoever cannot be sued for what is put up on its service by another party. And the letter from Sony to Twitter doesn't even address that. It's just random, meritless, specious threats. And that's a problem. You've got a giant multinational corporation threatening people. You've got them threatening people that can maybe take it, like Twitter and the New York Times and the Hollywood Reporter. But now you have them threatening people that really put their livelihoods on the line from these threats. And that's not okay. That being said, there's still open questions about all these things, right? Variety wound up posting an article. They had received one of these letters that say, hey, why publishing stolen Sony data is problematic, but it's necessary. And this is a whole lot of kind of navel gazing and moral introspection. And it's an interesting kind of editorial. If you want to check it out, it will undoubtedly be in the description to this video. But he says things like, it's getting harder for me to report on the contents of Sony's leak without wondering whether I'm somehow complicit with these nefarious hackers by relaying the details of seemingly every pilfered terabyte. And that's an ethical consideration. That's a worthy one for these outlets to have. That's a worthy one for the YouTubers to have. But the difference between nude celebrity photos and the leaked Sony data, respectable media outlets will argue, is only the latter is newsworthy. But what does that really mean? Perhaps newsworthy is as simple for some publications as if readers are interested in it, then it must be newsworthy. For others, newsworthy conveys some vague sense of the material being important. It's worthwhile to note that Sony is not a government. Conflating the imperatives behind covering a government and a corporation feels like a false equivalence to me. Both are sizable institutions, but am I, as a journalist, entitled to see every last spreadsheet a private company has, even if they were stolen, just because I report on Sony the way, say, Glenn Greenwald reports on Snowden? You can see them battling with this kind of concept. But they ultimately come out with the notion that it is the same. But what makes partaking of the Sony data truly unavoidable is that publishing content from the hack isn't materially different from what business journalists do every day. For instance, what if instead of sharing Pascal's salary from a purloined document, a trusted source discloses that information to me on the phone? In the world of video games, what if Jason Schreier has four anonymous sources that tell him what's happening at Rockstar Or somebody steals Rockstar's data and puts it in some kind of archive that can then be viewed by Kotaku and everybody else. What is the functional difference? It's either newsworthy in the first instance or it's not at all. And I think the way we all intuitively understand what happens in journalism is that if you get that information, if it's of something that is a significant corporation that is doing things of public interest, and that includes the making of multi-million dollar pieces of art, then that is something that should likely be considered newsworthy. But that hasn't been litigated, so that's something that is up for grabs. What isn't up for grabs is whether any of it is copyright infringement, right? If Sony wanted to send these letters to Jeremy at Geeks and Gamers or to whomever else winds up getting copyright struck for discussing these leaks at all, they could send a letter. They could send a letter that looks like the one that is from The Hollywood Reporter, and they could send it and say, hey, we think this is stolen material. If you would discuss this again, we are going to potentially hold you responsible for the damage done to our company. That is something that they could do. You can threaten anybody with anything if you like, but it isn't copyright infringement in any way. You only have copyright to what is your materials. And if Jeremy at Geeks and Gamers or anyone else isn't actually reproducing or preparing derivative works or distributing your materials, there isn't copyright infringement. And if someone is doing some of those things lightly, if they're talking about a screenshot that was disseminated, if they are otherwise kind of 
analyzing or critiquing what has been put out there, even if it was arrived at illegally, it's still fair use. If you use criticism, comment, news reporting on something, that's going to be fair use. Now, every specific instance is going to be based on the facts and circumstances. As you know, if you checked out our MXR Plays versus Juke and Media video, I basically looked at that and said, Juke and Media is probably right, assuming that they have the rights to the actual copyright that they are claiming, but that MXR Plays probably wasn't doing enough to transform the work. They probably weren't using it in a fair use way. And there is undoubtedly a case to be made for some YouTubers somewhere that got struck and legitimately so, that were just playing clips or that were just leaving screenshots up and not commenting over them. One of the problems with the copyright strike system on YouTube is once they get removed, it is very difficult for somebody like me to verify what the situation was before that strike. Because even if somebody comes up and says, hey, I put it up or I send it to you and it's exactly the same, it's hard to say that it is. I don't have the video that actually was the problem to look at and address for myself. The Juke and Media situation was different because they didn't issue a takedown. They asked for money. And that worked to our advantage because we were able to look at what they were asking for. But either way, the point of this video is that one, Sony has a history of massaging its legal rights to try to threaten and intimidate others. For the most part, journalistic press outlets are not going to be intimidated. They get letters like this from everybody all the time. And Sony knew that. They were just trying to encourage on the margins a little less dissemination and maybe a variety article like the one we just looked through that at least kind of says, hey, maybe I shouldn't be doing this and can get that out there and maybe influence a different journalistic outlet. But not only are they doing those things, but that the hammer of law that they have chosen to use, the DMCA, is completely the wrong hammer. That with the DMCA, you are allowed to go ask for copyright material to be struck down, but you have to identify the copyrighted work claimed to have been infringed, and you have to certify that you have a good faith belief that the use of that work was not authorized by the law. And that includes that there was no use of copyrighted material, or if there was use, that it was fair use. You have to consider those things if you are Sony. And so the DMCA, even if you think you can bring a claim about a First Amendment breach or some other privacy complaint because, hey, maybe we can argue it's not a matter of public concern, that doesn't give you the right to just use a completely different law to say that a copyright infringement has occurred. But, and I'll leave you with this, this isn't the only time that Sony has maybe been a little bit dicey about their use of the DMCA. In the immediate aftermath of the specific leaks that gave rise to all of the email controversy and those letters that we read, somebody at Sony Pictures Entertainment under the actual name of Sony Pictures Entertainment filed the following DMC action against Google, asking for some information to be taken down. Copyright claim, kind of work, unspecified, description, my salary is in Google due to Sony hack. Please remove of your results page. It's not right. It's not right. Well, that's not an identification. That's not even enough information for Google to act on. And Google never removed any of this stuff because Google's probably the wrong party to ask in this particular instance anyway. But Sony has a history of trying to elide the actual restrictions that are placed upon it. They also have a history of losing important data at important points in time. And while that is a shame, and while I am not in favor of The Last of Us Part Two plot points getting leaked out, and I haven't looked at them myself because I don't want to know them, I'm also not in favor of a giant monolithic corporation abusing the system of copyrights, the system of the DMCA, a system that is actually very useful to those platforms and those copyright holders that don't abuse it, that can actually help maintain the integrity of copyright as long as we don't have to have conversations like this. I'm very, very frustrated at what I've seen from a history of Sony, what I see them doing now, and the way they are using the DMCA and have used it in the past. And the one thing that keeps that frustration for me from boiling over is that much like the New York Times, I know darn well that reporting on, analyzing, critiquing, and considering the abuse of a, of a public legal process is undoubtedly newsworthy. And if Sony wants to come after me for that, they're going to have a significant problem on their hands.
This has been Virtual Legality for today. Thank you for joining us. We talk about these kinds of things all the time. If you enjoyed our previous video or if you enjoyed this one, please like, subscribe, ring bells, hit all, whatever else it might be that YouTube would encourage you to do to make sure that you find out about when we put videos up. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it in its podcast form, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.